Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to today's conversation. My name is Enolia, and I'm here with my co-host, Sarah Jane. And we're here with our special guest, Chaz Wesley. And we are so excited to have you on. We're going to speak about today um, the new now, change, loss, and grief, coping with a new normal by accepting the truth of the new now. And I would love for you, Chaz, to just share a little bit about yourself because when you think about the new now and then you went to coping with grief and loss and change, that, that kind of took me aback from what the new now would be about. So tell everybody a little bit about your background. Thank you, first of all, for having me. It's so nice to be with you today. My name is Chaz Wesley. I have been in hospice and palliative care um, field for many, many years, over 20 years. And I've been studying something called thanatology for about that long. It's the study of death, dying, and grief. Mm. And one of the things that I do in my private grief counseling practice is to talk about something called the new normal, if you will. And I have talked about this a lot with grievers, whether that was grieving the end of someone's life or grieving the end of a career, grieving the end of a family unit, whatever that is. And that new normal term gets thrown around a lot. And then you introduce this global pandemic and we're using that term in a different way. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you from a history of you know, being with those who are dying and then being with those in private practice um, counseling them through their bereavement. This understanding of a new normal has to be really taken down to a level that we can anchor to, if you will. The reason I say that is I'm going to just ask you some questions because this is a great conversation to have. What's your definition of normal? Mm. Right? Okay, you got so me right if, there. <laughs> I know. So if this is a, a, a thing that we're supposed to know about and that is in our language, but we can't even define it. And if you, Anoyo, defined it, it would be different than my definition, different from Sarah's, different from my neighbors. Someone once said the only normal is the setting on a washer or dryer. Like that's the only normal there is. And so when we talk about a new normal coming back, whether that's post pandemic in our life, everyday reality, or if it's post loss and we're trying to find normalcy again, oh, we have to unravel a little bit of that and figure out what that really means. I don't know that I ever want to go back to normal anyway. And what's new about it if we can't even define it in the first place? That's really, really, oh, wow, that's, that's deep. That's deep because there's so many ways that, that we use terminology and we just take for granted that it's understood, but it really isn't understood. So I'm going to ask you the most profound question because this has actually come up in my life, okay? Each one of us handles death and the, 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 the passing of a person differently. Me, myself, I find myself that, you know, because of my belief system, I believe that we are all energy. I don't believe that energy dies. So therefore, when somebody passes, they really, for me, transition to another beautiful plane. And it's just that their physical being, you know, has, has, has been emptied and the container is left. And that, you know, this whole aspect of, funerals and, and, and all of the stuff is really closure for everybody who was attached to that being. Mm -hmm. Now that saying that, making that statement and then looking at how my fiance, let's say processes death. I mean, he goes through, he goes through a process and I'm like, I get it, but I just don't get it. You know? And, and I know it's because of our belief systems. How do you, address the process of death and how somebody chooses to approach it? Oh, we have a saying in the palliative care world, and that is 
one will die as they have lived. Mm. And I have seen that over and over. If you're stressed throughout your life experience, you will die a stressful death. If you are more peaceful, your death will be more peaceful. If you're angry, your death will be angry. So to just know that peace is to have the awareness or even the awakening that we can choose something different at any time. And that happens right before death for a lot of people. Like you got to get okay with whatever it is, the God of your understanding, the afterlife, the relationships here on this planet. You got to get okay with that before you can really let go and move through that transitional period. The thing that comes up for grievers after that, we teach a, a model of grief called the tear model. It's been around for many years. We are used to speaking about it in terms of a linear stage thing. So we've all talked about the five stages of grief for decades. And we can kind of rattle them off, you know, denial and bargaining and anger and blah, blah, blah. And you finally get to acceptance. What we're teaching today is acceptance is actually where everything begins. Everything begins at acceptance, whether that's for the griever or whether that's for the one who's dying. And so part of this understanding is when we talk about a new normal, are we going to accept that? I don't want a normal. I, I want life to be exciting and fun and carefree and the comfort zone doesn't appeal much, right? <laughs> so just understanding that and what you said about your fiance, we have to meet someone where they are because his normal in his childhood and the religion of his family and the culture of his people was different normal than yours. And so those beliefs and those ancestral instincts are passed through. Sarah Jane. Uh, I want to go back to this question, the uh, question you asked first, which was, um, what is normal? Okay. Um, it, exactly. I have been saying for years, in fact, I've got a quote up, what is normal and whose definition is it anyway? Oh, wow. And, and, it, it, and that came about because I spent a number of years working with adults with learning difficulties. And, it, and I learned when I was a teenager what their normal is, is nothing like our normal. Right. Right. And each and every one of us have a different normal. That's right. And it is about accepting that. You think about people have, who have dyslexia, people who have different, you know, um, ADHD and all these other conditions that are, are, are so-called mental conditions, you know, sort of, their normal is very different. My own sister has been diagnosed with, um, well, one of these things, and she's got dyslexia as well. And her, the way she thinks is so totally different to the way the rest of us think yeah. because of her wiring. Right. And so it is really, really, and, and this, this is easier for me to understand because of my acceptance of working with the people with learning and physical difficulties, because their normal is so different. In the respect of passing, I have read a book called um, At Home with God by Neil Donald Walsh. And he refers to uh, the day we die is our continuation day. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. As you said, Inolia, it is about the soul, if that's what you want to use, the, the term you wish to use. I know it's not the term you use. It is about the soul leaving the physical form. It's had its experiences. The physical form may long be, get to cease to exist eventually. <laughs> but, but, the soul hasn't ceased to exist. In fact, the soul, for want of a better way of putting it, has gone home. It's its continuation day. And I love that. 
And so when my father was dying, and so this was just over 10 years ago, I had four or five different cancers, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, everything that he'd gone through. And I saw him the day before he died. And he was just lying on the bed. And I went in and I saw him. And I practitioner of Reiki. And several weeks before I'd been down, offered some sound energy, which is what I do, and some Reiki to him. And he'd had a bit of a session from me. And I'd had that inclination. I can attune him to the Reiki so that every time he goes for us to sleep, he can open the channel for himself. I didn't have to do any of the training. I just knew it was absolutely okay to do. And so I asked him, would you like to be attuned to the Reiki so that you can open the channel for yourself? And he said, are you sure that is okay? I said, I wouldn't have had the thought if it wasn't. So he said, yes, please. He said, but I won't remember how to open the channel. I said, oh, yes, you will. And that very last day, I went into his bedroom and he lay there with his hands together and he just repeated over and over and over again the opening of the channel. That prayer was, let this be over. Either I pass and I let go of life or I am cured. And he knew it wasn't going to be a cure. He just wished an end to it. And I sat with him and I thanked him for being my father. I told his mother died when he was five. So he was desperate. To, he really wanted his mum. He was back to being that child. And I said, your mum is here waiting for you, as is your dad. I had a sister that died at nine weeks old. I said, Gillian is also here. And my mother had miscarried two boys. And I said, and so are the boys here waiting for you. I am giving you permission to let go. They are waiting for you. He let go the following morning with my mother and my youngest sister there. And it was very peaceful. Sometimes people require permission to let go. And the truth is, I don't feel I've been able to grieve because I don't think there's a loss. I have not got the physical form of my father anymore. But his soul hasn't left any single one of us. He is still here for each and every one of us. And because of that belief in the continuation day, I don't feel there is a loss. But that is me. And I get it. My mother is not on that same plane. She really isn't. And it has been hard for her. The first couple of years were really hard. Um, so I think I can speak from an absolute experience. Do I have a fear of death? No. I will go yeah. with my time. That really leads perfectly to the next question that I want to ask Chaz, which is about recapitulation and the closure of the relationships that you that that should really take place before you pass because as Sarah Jane was talking a little bit about it when the ones who are actually passing don't have or don't feel like they can go because they haven't resolved those relationships i mean what what is it that you see in your experience i've worked with people only a handful of people passing them over but someone like yourself who's worked with many, many, many people passing over. You, I would, I would think that you have a lot. Well, I first want to say that Sarah mentioned something vitally important that probably comes out of my mouth more than anything else. And that is the word permission. Permission mm -hmm. is absolutely the key to anything, to letting go, to receiving, to facing your reality without resistance. So this permission 
mechanism that we have that we can grant to ourselves. You know, I could talk about permission all day, but I can't give it to you. You grant it to yourself, right? And then we can talk about it to another person. And that is the opening. That is the allowance. That's a better word. So in response to your question, I play with words a lot. And the word closure doesn't make much sense in my world. And the reason is we've just talked a lot about there's a continuation. Energy exists eternally. And then we talk about, but let's close this part of that energy. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense to me, right? So a better way to look at it, I don't want to close. My mother died 20 some years ago. I never want to have closure about our relationship in any way. I want to continue that in a new way. So I think one of the things I love to talk about is our agreement. What is my agreement with that soul? What is my agreement with the, the greater whole, whether you call that God or love or the universe, whatever name you give that? What is my agreement with my own mortality in all of this? And finding how I can continue that. I have agreements and contracts and shakes of hands and nods of heads all the time. So there is something there that says yes, closure says no. So to play with that, I say lighten up about the closure thing. I, I think that's wonderful. And I'm gonna get right back to you, Sarah Jane, because I, I sit back and I really wasn't thinking about closure in terms of the person passing more than closure in terms of the people who are around them, surrounding them and not wanting to let go such that they stop functioning, such that they can't continue their life because this longing and this, this, this wanting is so powerful that they'd rather just not function than come to terms with, and I love what you said, I guess agreement. Yeah. So Sarah Jane, I did I wanted to give you a chance to comment on that. I absolutely it with I think I suppose if you want to use the word closure, I think you've got to think about what you mean by that word. Mm -hmm. Because for, for many people that means closure, it's an end. But the end of something is also the beginning of something new. Yeah, that's right. So could it just be a matter of okay. That's it. Now I have to move on with my life. So it's not closure as the way the majority of us think about the word. It is just about the new normal and a new way of being, a new way of living, because actually there is an aspect of what was our normal that is now missing. And so it is really about thinking, OK, how do I proceed from here? And you talked about acceptance, Chaz. I have to accept that when I open that door, that individual is not going to be in there. One of the things my mother was, was suggested to my mother when my dad died was when you go out, leave a radio on so that when you come back there is a sound in the house there is not silence so you don't feel you are coming home to an empty home because that may be it's not maybe that is going to be very very difficult for people who've been together 60 odd years but 50 years 40 years 30 years and then grief isn't just about death. Grief is about the breakup of a marriage, a breakup of a friendship, a breakup of a relationship. It's the, it's the death of a pet, you know, or the loss of a pet. Grief comes in so many forms because loss does. We've had a loss of freedom. But some people have really thrived in that so-called loss of freedom because in other ways they have felt more free. 
what oh, finding a way of being comfortable with any form of change whatever that may be yes beautifully said i want to interject something and then i want to ask a question so i'm going back to um thinking about what Sarah Jane said when she first opened up and, and started talking. And one of the things that you had interjected was that you said that you had done Reiki. And so as a shamanic practitioner, you know, when I've helped others over and, and um, uh, basically help them pass over some of the key things energetically that I look for is just to make sure that all of the gates are open you know, to make sure that they, they have a, a, a truly a graceful passing. Can you comment at all if you want to? You may not want to, or it may not really pertain to any energetic healing or energetic work that you do as a healer, as a person is passing over, Chaz. Because these are things that we don't typically talk about. We don't talk about them. And, you know, they are taboo in some societies and then they are honored in other cultures, mm -hmm. right? Right. And so my culture, you know, one of my many branches on the tree is that of Native American Indian. And mm -hmm. that particular understanding is kind of what we're talking about. And there's little things that we do, like we have a window open throughout the entire illness or death process as a way for a spirit to have a, an escape, if you will, an exit. Um, not that it needs a window open, but it's our place of realizing there is a channel. And if I'm in the way of that, I'm the block, right? And so part of the energy work that you're asking about is really education. Like, what are you bringing into this room in the moment that this person is in the process of dying? We often think that this should be a communal event. <laughs> and I like to say death was never meant to be a public event. I mean, when I'm sick, I don't want anyone around. I don't want anyone to see me when my hair is messed up, when I'm, you know, sick in the <laughs> toilet, whatever that is, stay away. And the same is with the deathing process. You know, you look your worst, you feel your worst you're not really present to anything outside of your being anyway. And the energy work really is the clearing. It's always just the clearing. And that might not necessarily mean the clearing for the person who's going through the process of dying, but the clearing of the energy space in the room, the clearing of our energy before we enter the room. So it's just the awareness again. And part of my work is just the education of that, you know, and I've watched it work and I've watched people ignore that and come in with their problems and their family issues and, you know, all of that. And nothing is of benefit there. And the same thing happens on the other side of that, by the way, when the person has died, their physical form is no longer here. Now let's talk about the griever who we're going to use the word acceptance. How long do you think it gets you? It takes to get to acceptance after death. Research says almost two years. And that's an amazing thing to think about, especially in our culture and society today. We've lost a lot of things, whether that was through this pandemic or through, you know, loss of uh, a normalcy, if you will. We are not at that two year process yet of full acceptance. And that's a key part. I can accept a little bit today and a little bit more tomorrow and a little bit next week. Full acceptance doesn't just happen on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. It happens by this bite and this bite and this bite of this new reality. And so when we talk about acceptance, it's not just a flip of a switch. It's a gradual evolvement. And then when we are at that acceptance, that's sometimes when the real pain, the sorrow, the, the mourning, the grief really is allowed because now we've opened a new channel for us to be able to express that. 
And that brings us, if I may, to the next task. This is a task model of grief therapy that we teach. And that is, after we've gone through the pain of losing someone, the emotional, physical, spiritual pain of that loss, there is a moment in which we understand it is real. I have accepted it. I have grieved. Now I need to step back into life. Now I need to figure out what this new normal looks like and if I want to be a part of it, which is why I'd rather call it the new now, because it's a new now. Every moment that we breathe is a new now, but we're new in the now. The now is new, everything's fresh. And that's where our real power really is. Mm -hmm. But only when we are aware of that. Otherwise we step into it with fear because we fear the unknown. We step into it with anxiety. But let's educate and really talk about this is where the power is to do something, to reinvest in that life experience, not without that person, place or thing, but because of them and with them as co-creators. Beautiful, beautiful. Sarah Jane? Oh, absolutely. I love that. And yes, using the new now rather than a new normal. Because normal doesn't exist for anybody other than a perfect, it, the individual. Because none of our normals is the same nobody's normal is the same and our own normal can change just like that yeah and often does yeah, yeah. absolutely you know sort of relationships jobs family you know sort of we've we've I've got a new great niece just recently so that household is then the normal's just <laughs> totally been turned upside down <laughs> yeah but, but so as with birth as with death what was normal has suddenly changed. Right. So we create a new now. And going back to the different practices and techniques, and I know we're going back to a sort of a death in that respect, but I had a friend that, um, bless him, he was losing the use of his hands. He'd absolutely still got his marbles. He still enjoyed things, going out, whatever. But he was losing the use of his hands to the extent he couldn't even do his flies up. You know, so he had to start having people come round to prepare him meals, to help him dress and bathe in the morning. But he was still fully functioning in every other way. It was just his hands. But he was a very heavy smoker, and he had, did have other health issues going on. And eventually he agreed to have some techniques, um, some sessions from a technique called metamorphic technique. And I do remember him saying to me, he didn't have very many of them, but it is a technique that helps us to get out of our own way. So, you know, to get rid of those old unwanted behaviors that don't serve us any purpose anymore. But as I think with, with many other energy techniques, because that's what it is, it also can help us to let go. You know, anybody that would say to me, oh, will you use Reiki on my cat or my dog? It's not, it's very old and it's not well. I said, well, you do realize that it could help the animal to pass, don't you? Oh, no, I don't want that. Because it could. It has to be about the choice of the individuals receiving the energy. Graham said to me, he said, that hour of that session was better than a night's sleep for me. The last session he had from me was the day before he had a massive stroke and died a couple of days later. That session to me, because I'd gone on the Friday to give the session to him, offer the session to him. And he hadn't been there, he hadn't been at the house. And so I rang him later and I got hold of him and they'd taken him to a day center. Now I knew that he would not like that. I, I'd got to know him well enough. And then he had the session the following day and then he let go. 
he decided he didn't need to experience day centers <laughs> and that being part of his life. It was, yes, it was enormously sad, but it was also for me, it absolutely was him accepting he'd had enough for life. He wasn't going to be able to live it the way he would like to live it. He couldn't play his guitar anymore. So many things he couldn't do that he'd done. And he let go. He created that closure of the physical being so that his soul would go into continuation. So in that respect, it was an element of closure. It's a closure of this existence so that I can continue and I believe we come back. We have other experiences and he will be in another physical body somewhere, sometime. Wow, I'm sitting here listening to you and thinking about the fact that I had my mother's sister, one of her sisters, her youngest sister now that I think about it. And she was only in her, I think she had just turned 60 in her 60s, she had just turned 60 and she let go. She just decided she didn't wanna be here anymore because when I self reflect over the moments and the times that she actually went through, she had really given up on life and she just didn't, she, she just elected that she didn't wanna be here anymore and let go because um, I don't know, I, I just feel like there's a huge difference between someone fighting to stay versus letting go and, and ready to leave. And well, let's, also, let's also talk about choosing there because there's choice. The, the consciousness of choice is one of the highest levels of consciousness we can attain. And it often comes at the very end. Mm -hmm. It's not just choosing to let go, it's choosing where I'm going, whatever mm -hmm. that is for the individual, whatever is across that veil, I'm choosing that rather than this. The letting go is a little bit secondary in that, right? Because mm -hmm. the choice is so powerful to say yes to. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want to talk about this new now because that's the new perspective. It's the new choice all of a sudden. It's the new moment in which I can claim that. And in doing that, I simultaneously say yes to letting go as well. That's so powerful. And I, I, I want to stay on this because I remember when helping someone over, you know, a lot of people will sit there and say, you know, oh, they're a little out of their mind and out of their head and they're talking to themselves and that's okay, you know, because they're, it, it's been qualified as hospice time. So, you know, it, it's about to happen. But I have found that people are not out of their head and they're not out of their mind. What's happening is that they are half in this world and half in that. That's right. And that when they are actually grasping for someone, seeing someone, calling someone's name and everything else, that they are actually seeing that person on the other side. And we, because we can't see them and we're not there, are basically saying, oh, they're just out of their mind. Oh, a little bit of dementia. Oh, just, you know, whatever excuses we make up to justify what's taking place right before our eyes that we don't understand or that we can't witness. And that is a powerful time. It's a huge that is a powerful, really time. powerful time. You, do you want to talk about that a little bit? It happens more than most think. And because we don't understand it or we don't want it, we kind of shun away from it, whether we turn our head or we talk against it or we just deny it. But for the person going through it, you couldn't have said it better. They, they have a foot in both worlds on either side of this veil. And I have been in, in so many, whether it's a hospice room, a hospital room, at someone's home, and someone will invariably walk in and say, oh, no, you, there's no one here that, by that name. Or somebody, you know, the, the dying person will say, turn the light off or turn the light on. And we'll have conversation about there is no light. I mean, you have to understand we have these kinds of conversations running through our culture all the time. We don't believe victims. 
we are in this cultural war right now about domestic violence and, and all sorts of sexual abuse because we don't believe victims, because we can't see or hear the accused, right? And so as we talk about that, it's the same, it's in the same vein. We can't hear or see what they're hearing. So we don't really believe it until there's proof, until there's evidence. And that's what all of this conversation is really about. If we don't understand the definition of normal, it's still ethereal, right? If we don't understand it, we don't believe it, I have no evidence. And what you're talking about happens every day. We try to hold on to this loved one because we can't imagine them with, you know, not on the planet with us. We do a disservice in that because we all come onto this planet knowing that there's an expiration date at some point. <laughs> it's the agreement we have made. And yeah. it's, it's an interesting thing to, to witness that and then to just bring that back into um, what we were talking about earlier. If it's all energy, and it is, there's no bad in any of it, right? Let's just funnel all of the towards the good and figure out what that is. And Chaz, I, I just want you to comment on one other thing, which is, wouldn't that be akin to why we meditate? Wouldn't that be akin to why we want to, ex uh, to, to, to do the practices that we do so that we can exist to a higher plane in the first place, which is visiting and lifting the veil in the first place? Because many people, and I'm, I'm one of them, many of us have said, Oh, I, I got there and I was in such bliss. And I was so happy I didn't want to return. But yet when when we are when our physical container is breaking down, then the fear kicks in. But yet that's what we aspire to when we're meditating and everything else. That's exactly right. And you'll notice, I think when we get to that place in meditation where we never want to leave it. We know it's fleeting, but we just will do everything we can to stay there <laughs> because there's nothing else happening. When, when the dying are in that place and we walk in the room and have these weird conversations about don't leave and, you know, please don't, don't go. What a tug of war that is. And that's why the choosing is such an amazing piece to talk about because I will choose that silent place of healing. And death is, you know, so many times in hospice, I, I heard over and over, you're in hospice because you couldn't be healed. Well, there's truth to that. And death is the ultimate healer. It's the ultimate healer. I think it was Ram Dass who said, healing doesn't mean going back to the way things were before. That's not what healing is. Rather, it's allowing what is now to move us closer to the divine. What is now to move us closer to our choosing. Move us closer to that place of absolute health and well-being. Yeah. Yeah, there's is a book I read many years ago, and I think it was called Life After Life. And there were many stories of near death and of people that were dying. And one that sort of stuck out was, um, there was, um, I think it was a more mature lady that was dying. And the family were there, don't die, don't die, don't die. And she, every time she was getting ready to go, and then there was family there and it was just, and she didn't feel she could go while the family were there. How many times do you hear people say, I was with them for hours. I just needed to take a comfort break. And they passed when I left the room because they feel they have to stay while you're there. That's why my whole thing was give my father permission. That's right. You know, because he, know, wasn't we actually, better. he was not going to be my, the father, the, the old now, you know, it was, it was not the old normal. He was never going to be that again. He was suffering. 
why the heck would I want to keep him in that? I didn't. And in a heart of hearts, neither did my mother. But of course, yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure my two sisters as well, you know, the grief. But because of my my belief, my understanding, I was able to cope with it differently. In hospice and palliative care. So Chess, go ahead, because I know you wanted to interject on that one. Yeah. In in hospice and palliative care, whether it's a hospice nurse, a chaplain, a death doula, our educational piece is just what you had said. It is more apt, the person who's dying is more apt to die when there's not an audience, when their loved one has gone to the bathroom, to the chapel down the hall, whatever that is. And again, it's it's kind of like when we're sick, I don't want anyone to be in the audience or the witness of that. And it's a very personal piece in that. I also want to interject something else here. We talk so much about this going back and forth and this side of the veil and that side of the veil and the choosing and the acceptance. We have to also remember duality in all things and the fact that things can and do happen simultaneously. So grief and gratitude can exist simultaneously. Hope and heartache can live in the same space. And joy and sorrow can both be present. That's the wholeness of it all. Grief is another language for love. It's another expression of love. It's not the opposite of it. And that's what's really powerful in any new now is to bring the wholeness of you, the wholeness of whatever that topic or subject is. Otherwise, we're just having a one-sided conversation. And that's the feeling of being lost. Yeah. So I want to share a story with you because um, as we're talking about this, and it really is predicated on the fact of uh, when people decide to leave. And it's interesting because I was working um, for, for, my, for my Fortune 500 company and there was a temp there and she was a real firecracker. And I got the chance to really sit down and, and get to know her. Her name was Mary. And as I was getting to know her, Mary was probably in her 60s at the time, mid 60s. And I was, I was in my 40s. But, you know, as I got to know her, we had ended up having this really, really profound conversation. And I was sharing with her that, you know, when my mother had passed, um, when my mother and I had saw each other a week before she passed, and how devastated I was because the weekend that I was gonna come down, I, I lived four hours away, the weekend I was gonna come down, my mother was like, oh, don't come down this week and wait until Monday. It was the Monday before Thanksgiving. I'm getting out of the hospital on Monday, you know, I'll see you on Monday and then we'll, we'll go from there. And we had had this beautiful deep conversation prior to it. And I was sharing with Mary at the time, I realized when I go back over that conversation over and over and over again in my head that my mother knew that she was going to go. She knew that she wasn't going to be there that following week and that I was going to be there. And what she had said to me were her goodbyes. And I was sharing with Mary how it had devastated me you know, that I didn't have this opportunity to be there closer when I when I had intended on being there. Even if I had seen her that Friday and she passed Saturday, you know, at least I was there. And she shared a story with me that I want to share with you, which is that Mary expressed to me that she had died. She had actually died. She was in a very, very bad car accident. Um, they got her and she died in the ambulance. And they had to revive her. And she shared with me that experience of her dying. And she shared that she had, you know, saw this light, went to the light, paused before she got to the actual light. And there was an angel that spoke with her there. And the angel said, you know, it's time. And she's like, I know it's time, but what about my daughter? And the angel had said, you know, well, you have a choice you can go back. And um, she was like, but it's so beautiful here. I want to stay, but I know my daughter needs me down. The angel warned her, if you go back, it's going to be extremely painful. And she made her choice and she came back. 
And just to summarize the story, she it took her four years to learn how to walk all over again. Excruciating thing. But the point that she made to me is she said to me, Enolia, when we die, we all have a choice. And we have a choice to leave our loved ones when they and 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 allow them to say their goodbyes. Or we have a choice to leave our loved ones and leave right away without them seeing us. And your mother did not want to see you before she left. She said, sometimes for us, it's too painful to say our goodbye. So we wait for the moment that you turn your head, the moment that you walk away and we just slip away because it's too painful for us to have you there watching us leave. She said that your mother loved you and she wants the best for you, but it was just too much and you have to honor her wishes. We think that death is about us and the ones that are around waiting, but it's not about what we want. It's about what they wanted. And I, I wanted to share that story, especially because for those of us who are sitting there, you know, going, oh, I'm going to beat myself up. I wasn't there. They didn't want you there. Right. They didn't want that moment. It was their choice, not ours. And that's when the realization hit me. Like, whoa, okay, I get it. I get it. It's not my choice. And then I calmed down. You know, that, that pain yeah. actually. So I wanted to share that story. And you can comment on both. And then I wanted to ask you, because I know we could go on about this topic forever. I'm like, I'm really into it. I'm really, really into it. But what would you do or how would you coach somebody who is in that grieving stage for over that two years that just won't let it go? Just won't let it go. How do you help them? What do you say to them? So my private practice is almost completely just that client. I mean, I am dealing with people who are experiencing what we might call compounded grief, um, extended grief. And we think, oh, what a horrible thing that is to carry that burden. And the reason I'm carrying it is because, like you said, I can't let it go. I can't get it out of my mind. I can't stop looking for him or her. I can't accept. And that's really what it boils down to. So again, let's just play with the terminology. What does letting go mean? Because we have a very, we kind of put blinders on about things and we say, letting go looks like this. Surrender looks like this. Acceptance looks like this. But that's based on your normal, right? That's based on your perception and your understanding and your belief. And so the letting go is something to get clear about because there's a lot of ways to let go. Here in the States, we have this show running um, called Tidy Up or Tidying Up. Maybe you've seen it, but it's this woman who goes in and teaches people how to clean their closets and organize their life and go a little more, you know, minimalistic. And what she teaches is an old technique of holding that and just asking, does this spark joy? And if the answer comes, yes, keep it. If the answer is not a resounding yes, why keep it? The letting go is an interesting thing when we give ourselves permission to do it. But just like, I'm gonna grab something off my desk here. I think we talk about letting go in a weird way in that if I have these reading glasses in my hand and you're asking me to let them go. And th this is how I see, this is how I read, this is part of my existence, whatever that is. And you're asking me to let go, boy, you're gonna have to pry this out of my cold hands before I will. And we hold on to it with white knuckles. And finally, when we give ourselves permission to let it go and it falls, what are we left with? We're left with this feeling of grasping for what was this feeling of an emptiness, or even a feeling of abandonment, if it wasn't in our choosing. That's one way to let go. Let me show you the same thing, person, place, thing, experience, event, holding onto it tightly, asking 
of ourselves even to let it go. Watch me let it go in a new way. What are we letting go of? I'm not letting go of the person, the place, the thing, or the event. I'm letting go of holding on. I'm letting go of holding on. And when I let go in a more gentle way, this person, this soul, this experience, this being doesn't leave, doesn't go anywhere outside of my realm. I just am not in control anymore of how it shows up, <laughs> right? And so I think I love this conversation because it really moves us to look at things from a different perspective. Beautiful. Sarah Jane. I love what you've just said because one of the things that sort of I've heard to do with sort of letting go, um, and it's letting go and letting God, um, not that that's necessarily a terminology I tend to use anymore, but it's what you're doing is you're giving it to the universe. You're opening your hands and you're saying, okay, this relationship, this job, this whatever it is, this grief, I'm offering it for it. And it's offering it to the universe so that it can come back to you healed in whatever way. So you're not. If you let go of somebody, a relationship, say, okay, fine, I'm not convinced this relationship's working. I'm, or more to the point, you're giving them freedom, the freedom of choice, whether they stay or whether they go. But when you've given them the freedom of choice, if they stay, they stay because they choose to, not because they feel they're being held, they're being bullied, they're any, anything else other than choice. And maybe also with the grief thing, it is about feeling heard. Because I think when it comes to trauma, um, which leads to obviously major grief in people, trauma is, 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 is can be pretty horrendous. And obviously a death can be very traumatic to people. Um, it is about feeling heard. These are my feelings about this. And after sort of two years, you're still struggling with those feelings. But of course, everybody's moved on from that. They've got on with their lives. But if you're the person like my mother, like a father, like a, a, a daughter who's very close to a, a parent, um, they are the ones still stuck in that. They are the ones feeling that with, with everybody else. Okay, they've spent a couple of months maybe asking, are you okay? But not really listening because you haven't been, that's not been the time for you to talk. Maybe further down the line is when you are ready to talk. When you are willing to open your hand. And feeling listened to, feeling heard, whatever is going on in our lives is really important. The healing of the inner child is that inner child really wishing to be heard. The hurt, the pain, the trauma, the same goes with grief it is the somebody that will listen they don't necessarily wish you to say anything they wish to be heard and sometimes just that ability to be able to talk and express their feelings which may be very difficult for them but to be able to do that and have somebody who is just there for them. That is what so many people require, but really struggle to do because part of the conversation we were having before we started was um, the one thing we aren't taught is to love ourselves, to be true to ourselves. 
and to share from our own hearts what is going on with us. And it's finding that safety to be able to do that. And that is when the healing, we never ever stop loving that individual. We never will. But that can make the biggest of differences. Yes. I love what you say there, Sarah, because I see that all the time. And I just want to also add, we try to have conversations and the, the reason we often don't feel heard is because the person we're having the conversation with doesn't understand this language. Grief is a language unto itself. It's a journey unto itself, which is why have the conversation, have, have the, the dialogue with someone who understands the language. That might be a grief counselor, it might be a, a pastor, it might be another griever. But if you're talking to someone who's normal, does not include this grief that you're going through, you might be able to be talking to a wall. So that's our responsibility. And that's why every new now includes a new agreement. And that's where our consciousness of choice, our acceptance, our allowance really merges. And when we can step into that, I think it's vitally important, not just for our own sanity, but for our healing of not only this moment, but every next now moment there is. Acceptance of self in whatever that may mean yeah. for who you are. That's beautiful. So we're coming up on an hour and I want to, yeah, I, I want to continue this, but I know that we have to have at some point a, a, a closure. So I'm going to ask, do you have any last thoughts that you want to share with our audience? You know, people may ask, well, how do I get into this new now? Like, what is, what is it to step into that? And I have read Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, a hundred times. It's one of my favorite places to, to understand the concept of now. And what it really boils down to is this. We have to anchor ourselves in truth. We have to anchor ourselves in something that is real. And when we feel abnormal in our body, it's because we're talking about the ethereal. There's no anchoring to anything. So just find what's true today in front of you. It may be a nebulous thing. It may just be that there is a loss that's true. And then take a breath and see it from that new perspective that this now also is temporary. And there's, there's where the simultaneous gratitude can come in, right? So this is the power that you have. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful. Sarah Jane? I think it's just accepting that you haven't got to think about the next hour, the next half day, the next evening, the, the next week, the next month, the next year. Live in the now. In the now. Just allow yourself to take one step at a time. I was affected by um, potentially um, Emmy quite a few years ago. And I literally struggled to put one foot in front of the other. Getting up out of bed exhausted me. I literally had to take one step at a time. That, and okay, that's a physical, but actually by doing that with our daily lives, worrying about what's gonna happen in the future doesn't affect the future, it steals the now. When we live in the now, and if that's, I wish to ball my eyes out, do it. I wish to have a happy memory go and look at a photograph album or whatever. 
do it. Do what makes you feel comfortable. And if that's tears, that's tears in the moment. And if you feel like going out and being amongst people, do it. If you feel like being alone in your own home, do it. And you don't have to explain yourself to anyone. I love that. And I will just add one more thing, and I know we need to close. Eckhart Tolle said exactly what you just said, in that the first important step into any now moment, is simply to become aware of what surrounds you. That's anchoring yourself to the truth. That's anchoring yourself to reality. Whether you like it or not, <laughs> that is the most important <laughs> first step. And that's always a now step. And Olia, your final thoughts. And I, yeah, I just wanted to share that I really learned a lot. And I love the fact that it's not closure, it's an agreement. Oh, and what I didn't realize is that I had made several agreements, which is probably why I feel like I'm able to grieve and go through that process, but, but really just live the new now, having felt that all is in balance as to how I process and handled what has taken place. And I love the terminology. So if our audience doesn't get anything out of this, think about the person, the terminology, and the fact that we do impress upon our own value set and our own value of what we believe normal is and that it may not match with who you're talking to. So sit back, relax, listen, and do not speak unless asked. Because just like Sarah Jane said, sometimes people don't want to hear your opinion. They just want you to listen. They just want it to come out. And it's called holding space. Hold the space for the iterations that the person needs to go through in order to go through whatever process it is that they need to go through without imposing your value system, your perception of what normal is, and your judgment. And that to me, I think is a phenomenal takeaway. And before we close completely, Chaz, why don't you share where people can reach you if, if you want to reach Chaz for coaching or for your grieving process? Thank you. My website is chazwesley.com, C-H-A-Z-W-E-S-L-E-Y. And I will just share with you on that website, when you go to the events and classes button, I am continuing this conversation with a class called The New Now. It starts starts uh, March 8th at 11 a.m. Central. That will be about 5 p.m. GMT, I think. And it's a class that's being sponsored by my home church, um, Unity of Tulsa Midtown. And they want to have this conversation with the world. And I think it's a beautiful thing. It's a four week class. I invite people to, to come be part of that conversation and get clear on what a new normal might look like, but rather what a new now can look like because of our power. Beautiful. Thank you. Chaz, we, we will put your information under the video as well that, right. uh, that goes up on YouTube. Um, and myself and Anolia's, that, that'll be there too. Obviously, if there's anything that we've said. But Paul, thank you very much for your comment. Thank you. This is a beautiful discussion that we all need to hear. We mm. all will go someday. And it is important to know about and see the beauty in the transition. So thank you, Paul, for that comment. So very much appreciated. Um, and to a certain degree, we will be continuing this conversation um, because in, well, just under two weeks time, on the 23rd, Anolia and myself are going to be joined by Mary Walken. And we are going to be discussing, don't handle grief, let it heal. So I hope that you will consider joining us for that. Thank you folks for being here, for joining us. 
Thank you so much, Chaz, for joining us and for all that you have shared with us. And for, yeah, I think with the, both Anonia and myself, helping us to sort of be more, I suppose, in tune with, um, with, with, with the life and at the end of life. Um, so, and so it's very much appreciated. Thank you to all of you. Please feel get free to get in touch with Chaz, with ourselves. Um, that's what we're here for. That's why we do the conversations. But in the meantime, please take care, be safe, stay well. Namaste, sweet souls. Goodbye. Aho. Bye. Thank you.